Golden State Media Concepts Baseball Podcast. We cover everything major league from spring training to the World Series. We've got your favorite club covered from New York to Boston to LA. This is the Golden State Media Concepts Baseball Podcast. Thank you for listening to the Golden State Media Concepts Baseball Podcast, where we discuss everything in the world of Major League Baseball. My name is Ben. And I'm Jeremiah. And we are back here on a Wednesday, and we have an exciting time for baseball. It is literally the holy mecca of baseball. It is the World Series, Jeremiah. Last night we had game one. Yeah, we did. And Cleveland took a one to zero game lead over the Chicago Cubs and it was a huge night for Cleveland in sports. You know, they have the Cleveland Cavaliers hanging up the championship banner for the NBA Finals and then just not even far away, literally across the street, Cleveland Indians were hosting game one of the World Series. So it was a huge night for Cleveland and they start off on a good note and, you know, Corey Kluber picks six innings, nine strikeouts. He was a beast last night. That's all I got to say, man. He was throwing some heat. He was nasty with his pitches. Uh, Lester did pitch uh, five and two-thirds innings, had seven strikeouts. But, you know, there's a couple times where he was all over the place. All over the place at all. So, yeah. But it was a pretty exciting pretty exciting game from what, from what I've seen. And, uh, you know, the crowd was really into it. And I said before, you know, this whole series started, this is going to be a World Series where both of the home crowds are going to be super loud. Super passionate. These are two teams that haven't won the championship in so long. Both of these teams have one of probably both of the longest droughts in baseball, probably all of sports to have a championship. And I think it was just exciting. It's going to be a fun series to watch. I think it's going to be fun. Definitely. So as you mentioned, the Indians take game one. They win that game 6-0 to zero last night over the Cubs. Corey Kluber, you mentioned, had a great, great performance, and he did. He really had that two-seam fastball especially to left-handed hitters working so well. It seemed like they were almost afraid they were going to get hit, and then it just like curves right back over the, the middle of the plate for a strike, and he had that going all night long. For me, the key stat with Kluber was his pitch count. He only threw 88 pitches. This sets him up perfectly to go on short rest in Game 4, possibly if we go to Game 7 as well, if he can keep this pitch count under under wraps 88 is literally nothing when you look at this indians bullpen andrew miller who was the alcs mvp he hasn't even given up a run in the whole entire postseason last night down three to zero the cubs have the bases loaded with no outs andrew miller's on the mound he doesn't even give up a run so he gets out of that jam the eighth inning he pitches doesn't even get touched you know what i mean so I think when you look at this bullpen, if they can get six innings out of their starter, whether it be Bauer or, or Kluber, Danny Salazar got activated, I don't know if he'll maybe get a start, maybe just some like some side things out of the bullpen. But if they can get six innings out of a starter, turn it over to Andrew Miller, to Cody Allen, to Shaw, this great bullpen that Cleveland has, I think the series looks pretty good for them. Yeah, I think it does too. And don't forget they have home field advantage. Have home field advantage as a very important for the World Series. And, you know, I think this game is going to go seven games. I think the series is going to go seven games. I think, you know, this is going to be a really fun series to watch. And, you know, as the Cubs, you know, the pressure is on them again. It's on them again, just how it was in the past two series. You know, can they really rebound in game two? Do they really want to fall down two games going to Wrigley? And I know Wrigley is a kind of a tough place to play in postseason. We've seen it this year. You know, we've seen how Kershaw played in game five or game six of that uh, NLCS. So can the Cubs rebound and kind of, you know, take off the pressure? You know, they're, the pressure is still there. You know, Cleveland Indians, they have no – don't get me wrong. You know, they 
they have the World Series to lose, but they don't have as much pressure on them as the Cubs do. I definitely, I definitely agree with you. The Cubs' last World Series one was nineteen oh eight. Their last appearance in the World Series was nineteen forty six. So Cubs fans have literally lived their whole entire lives and died without even seeing their team in the World Series, let alone win it. You know what I mean? So it's definitely been quite a while. But yeah. and they're the best team all season long, the most wins. But you know what? The Indians, they're the they're the team with the hot hand right now. They're the team riding high. They only lost one game, and that was game four of the ALCS in the whole entire postseason. Terry Francona as a manager with the win last night is now 9-0 and in the World Series after winning two World Series, sweeping the opposition with Boston. So he's now 9-0 and as a manager in the World Series. The Indians are playing hot. They got the hot pitching right now. Prior to even this game, I actually picked the Indians to win on Monday on the sports show in seven games. So I don't really see any reason that can change. So I think I think the Cubs are definitely the team with the with more pressure. But we've said that for the last two series now. We said that in the NLDS against the Giants. We said that in the NLCS last week against the Dodgers. And what did the Cubs do? They overcame both those obstacles and looked pretty, pretty convincingly victorious. They were down 2-1 to the Dodgers. They went three in a row to go to the World Series, win the Series 4-2. So we've seen this before, and they can overcome this. I think this is probably their toughest test. But still, I think you definitely have to still consider them the favorites. Who, the Indians or the Cubs? The Cubs. Yeah, I, I have the Cubs still winning the World Series. Um, I do think this is going to be all seven games. This team, both of them compete. They kind of match up well against each other, so to speak. You know, you got the Cleveland Indians pitching going against the Cleveland, I mean, not the Cleveland, Chicago Cubs lineup, which actually kind of gained a boost last night. They have Carl Schwarber back. If you don't forget, he got hurt first week of the season, torn ACL. He came back in DH last night. You know, he get he did get a I think he got he smacked a double, I think, last night. And if he had any time behind him, that probably would have been out of the ballpark. He really torched that ball. But I think, you know, there was some criticism of, about, you know, bringing Schwarber back because he doesn't have a lot of seasoning. You can't just turn it on like that. Even though it is uh even though it is baseball. You, in any sport, you can't just like be gone the whole year and all of a sudden just be on top of your game for like the championship series. You just can't do that. And but he's probably not going to play in Wrigley. He's probably going to play any of those games unless he's a pinch hitter. He's going to be mainly used as a DH. That's probably the only way I think they'll use him. But he does give the Chicago Cubs a potential boost because of what he can do with the bat. So I do think you know he adds an element to the Chicago Cubs lineup. Absolutely. The the Cubs did say that they're not going to play Schwarber in Wrigley Field. He would be normally play, be playing left field if he was healthy, but they're not going to do that. They're just going to have him be a GH, which, as you mentioned, just is a is a good addition to that to that lineup. Do you add him as a DH? And then when you look at the Indians, they're going to lose. You know, maybe Santana, maybe Napoli, depending on who they put out there when they go to Wrigley Field. So because they don't have the DH. So they're going to be losing a player, and then Schwar- Schwarber just kind of comes in as an addition to the Cubs. So I do give them the advantage in that aspect. But don't don't uh, sort of credit, credit this Indian offense not too bad. You know, Roberto Perez had two home runs last night. Francisco Lindor has been probably their best offensive player throughout the whole entire postseason. He had three hits again last night. Jose Ramirez at third base had three hits in an RBI. So this lineup for the Cubs, I'm not sorry, not for the Cubs, but for the Indians is also doing good things. Yeah, I want to talk about Perez, you know, the catcher. He had two home runs. Two home runs. Probably played the game last night. But I want to talk about game two before, you know, we take our first break here. Uh, We got a matchup of uh, Jake Arrieta versus Trevor Bauer. And this is going to be Trevor Bauer's first uh, postseason start since, quote-unquote, drone gate. The bloody, ugly, bloody finger. The bloody finger. Yes. Uh, So it's the first game since that. Um, You know, I do think... Trevor Bauer might have something to prove. and uh, But I have to give this game to the Cubs because, you know, Jake Arrieta is on the mound. I have to give the edge to them. Um, you know, they got to take that pressure off. They The Cubs cannot fall 2-0 to zero in the World Series. They just can't. Because I feel if they fall 2-0, to zero, I don't – even though this team will go back to regular game three, I don't know how they will come back from that. All the one man is going to be in the Cleveland side. So I think they have to win this game. I think this is a must-win game. I know it's only game two, but it's a must-win game because you do not want to give Cleveland the momentum going back to your house. You just don't want to do that. 
So Jay Carrieta, although he is the reigning exciting award winner, and he is Jay Carrieta, he has struggled this postseason. Yeah, he he's has. He's got an he ERA has. of 4.91. But when you look at Trevor Bauer, his opposition, he's got an ERA of 5.06. Plus, he's having to deal still with that nagging pinky injury. He did throw a simulated game, and it didn't seem to bother him. But you got to think in the World Series with the pressure, maybe if you get a cut on it or something, like someone hits a, a line drive back at you. I don't know. I'm just throwing some no, no, it, out there. No, no, it could happen. It could, yeah. it could have an effect on him. So I think he's probably still going to be looking at it. You mentioned sort of if the Cubs win tonight, I think they're in a really good spot, and I agree. Because they're going to be having Game 3, Game 4, and Game 5 at home in Wrigley Field. So it goes 2-3-2 two, two, instead of 2-2-1-1-1. Two, two, one, one, one. So... The Cubs will have three consecutive home games if it gets to game five. So if you win tonight, that makes it 1-1. Then you have three straight home games. If the Cubs can even get away with two of those wins, they'd be up 3-2 in the series going back to Progressive Field in Cleveland with two games left. you got to think they'd probably win one of those two games. So I think if they win tonight, which I honestly do expect to happen, I think the Cubs win tonight. I like Arrieta over Bauer. I think if the Cubs win tonight, they're in a really, really good position because they're going to have three more in a row. Which I'm really not a fan of. You know, we've seen that before in the NBA as well as MLB. I now. think the reason why they do that is because you know it's difficult to travel in baseball. I know? agree, yeah, but it's more difficult from, Ohio, schedule. from Ohio yeah. to Illinois is not that much of a travel. I can that realize. Is, that, I, I understand yeah. if you're going West Coast to East Coast. Like if we were looking at the Dodgers against the Cubs, maybe a little bit, or the Dodgers, Dodgers against for, the Mets. Yeah. No, I'm just throwing something out, but yeah. they're in the same National League. But I can understand there a little bit, but still, I'm not a big fan of that. But I think. If it goes 1-1, then the Cubs have a huge advantage, especially because the Indians are going to be losing their DH, something they're not accustomed to all year long, and having their pitcher hit, which they're not accustomed to all year long either. So I would give the Cubs advantage if they win tonight, which I do expect to happen. Yeah, and you touched on it. like you, They're going to have three straight games in Wrigley Field, you know, the Cubs. They are going to have that advantage because of, you know, they used to having, not having that DH there. So that's a little bit of their disadvantage for Cleveland. They lose a player... But, you know, Cubs, they've been playing that way the whole entire year. If if this series is tied 1-1, then, you know, having three straight home games at Wrigley, you got to be right and high. You got to be because, you know, I'm not going to say the Cubs are going to win all three straight games at Wrigley Field. I just think the Cleveland Indians are – they pretty much have been really consistent, probably the most consistent team in the postseason. That's why they're here at the World Series. You know, they can play – on the road, you know, they did it against, you know, Boston. They did it against Toronto for the first two games. So they can do it. They can do it against this team. That's why it's so important for the Cubs to get one win at Cleveland. If they just get two wins at Cleveland in this whole entire series, they can possibly win the whole thing. I they definitely have The whole definitely entire agree. series. If it's a seven-game series, if the Cubs get two wins in Cleveland, then the Cubs should have no excuse to win this whole the, the whole series. I agree with you on that one. And game two is tonight. It's at it's on Fox. It's seven Eastern, four Pacific. MLB had to move the game up an hour because there is concerns of rain, especially in the later hours. So if this game kind of lingers on, if we have a lot of pitching changes, we could be dealing with some rain. But baseball did move it up to try and avoid that issue. Also, it's going to be really cold. This is Ohio. It's the middle sort of end of October now, so it does get pretty cold there. So we'll have to see if the weather has an effect on any of these starting pitchers. If they get kind of cold out there on the mound, freezing, we'll have to see if that has an effect. Yeah, and we're going to take our first break, and we're going to get into some AO East news. Yes, we are. Right. All right, we'll be right back here at the Golden State Media Concepts Baseball Podcast. Tired of searching the vast jungle of podcasts? Now listen close and hear this out. There's a podcast network that covers just about everything that you've been searching. Hey! The Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network is here. Nothing less than a podcast bliss with endless hours of podcast coverage. From news, sports, music, fashion, cooking, entertainment, fantasy, football, and so much more. So stop lurking around and go straight out to the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. Guaranteed to fill that podcast itch. Whatever it may be, visit us at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter. And download us on iTunes, SoundCloud, and Google Play. And welcome back to the Golden State Media Concepts Baseball Podcast. And Ben and I are going to get into some 
news out of the American League East. Uh, we're going to talk about the Blue Jays, a team that got eliminated by the Cleveland Indians in the AOCS. The Blue Jays expect to make quali- uh, uh, qualifying offers to potential free agents Jose Batista and Edwin Encarnacion, but have yet to decide whether to make the same offer to outfielder Michael Saunders, who pretty had a pretty resurgent year. You know, I might add, after struggling majority of his career in the majors, Michael Saunders was a key part of this offense in the Blue Jays. So in the season-ending news conference Monday, Blue Jays general manager Ross Atkins said that the decision to extend qualifying offers to the sluggers was, quote-unquote, about as easy a decision as we'll make. So what did you think of, uh, you know, these qualifying offers to these sluggers here who were pretty huge part of this team, you know, for the past few seasons? It's, it's definitely an obvious decision, like you said. But the problem here is that both Bautista and Encarnacion are expected to reject these qualifying offers, reportedly set to be around $17.2 million dollars because they want to land a more lucrative long-term deal, which you would expect. So they're going to try and reject these offers, but it seems like they both want to stay in Toronto. They have said that. This is a really weak free agent class coming up, so these two are definitely some of the headliners. And giving off, sort of feeding off their seasons they had, Encarnacion had 42 home runs. Batista struggled with injuries, but he's still capable of doing big things. So it looks like they're going to have to splash the cash if they want to bring both these guys back. I like that splash of cash. Thank you. So, I mean, I don't really know. These guys are getting kind of old. Encarnacion's really just a DH now. So, do you want to pay your DH more than seventeen million? And then we look at Batista, just an outfielder, kind of getting old, dealt with some injuries lately. I realize they're a key part of Toronto's offense, along with people like Josh Donaldson. But, I mean, that's they're going to have to pay a lot of money for these two guys. Yeah, and I completely understand why these. Both of these players want long-term deals, but Edwin, Edwin Encarnacion has mainly just been a DH, and you don't, do you really want to pay a guy a lot of money just to not play defense and just hit? And don't get me wrong, Encarnacion was a very important part to this team. You know, he was tied with David Ortiz for the American lead, League and 127 RBI, so he had a really good year, but, you know, as you said, been 42 home runs. He only did bat 263. Uh, I think, and it was the first, um, you know, baseman designated hitter. You know, he was an all star for the third time this year. So I don't expect, you know, both of these guys to come back. Um, you know, they do want to stay in Toronto, but I do not see the Blue Jays, you know, splashing the cash, so to speak, to both of these guys, especially Batista. You know, he is 36, he did have some injuries this year. We talked about throughout the summer, you know, he kind of had a drop off a little bit late. Um, he did homer twice in the American League playoffs, so he did. He was valuable there, but yeah, in a season of 162 games, I don't think Batista. You know, I don't see he think he's that valuable for the Blue Jays right now. I think they are. I think they have to get younger at that position. So you're saying definitely Encarnacion is the more important player. Both of them are important. Both but of them if are you can only player. have one. I, I I think I'm going to take it, – it, okay, this question is very hard because, you know, Encarnacion only plays DH. I think if they can get Encarnacion on a reasonable deal, I would take him over Batista because Batista literally is getting older. Literally got ling- – he got lingered with injuries this entire year, and we've seen it how, you know, he had a, kind of a drop-off in reduction when he was healthy. So I would take Encarnacion only if the Blue Jays can get a reasonable deal. I do not want to pay, you know, and designate here like $70 million a year just to not play defense. If they can get him on a reasonable deal, then I will take him. But I just don't think, you know, I think Blue Jays have to move on from Batista because of his age and his injury history this past season. I would tend to agree with you. If you can only have one, I I guess you would go with Encarnacion. But we'll have to see what Ross Atkins and the sort of front office of Toronto feel like with these next couple of weeks. They have about five days to negotiate a deal before they officially become free agents, which I think is going to happen. So we'll have to see if they're going to pay up for both these guys, one of them or even ne- neither of them. They could go with that route as well because Encarnacion over the last five years has been averaging 39 home runs and about 100 RBIs, which is great. But he's getting up there in age as well, and he's, like you said, only a DH. So he doesn't really help you in the field. 
help you on the base pads or anything like that. All he does is really hit. So I'll have to see what Toronto feels like is more important. Yeah, and then we got some other news out of Boston that you want to tell a listener's been for the Boston Red Sox. Definitely. So yeah. the Boston Red Sox team had a great, great season loss in the ALDS to the Cleveland Indians. They announced on actually Tuesday, yesterday, that the organization will not fill its vacant general manager position following the Diamondbacks hiring of Mike Hazen as their GM. So Mike Hazen was part of their front office sort of in Boston. So the team did name Eddie Romero, who's the senior vice president, as the assistant GM. And he's going to sort of coordinate in that role and be there, which he's been in sort of for the last 11 years with the with the organization. So they said the Red Sox are very pleased to announce Eddie's promotion to assistant general manager. That's what the president of baseball operations, Dave Dombrowski, said in a press conference. This is a very talented individual who we think can make a real impact for us with our background in player evaluation and his knowledge for minor league system. A native Spanish speaker, his ability to communicate with both players and staff is significant, especially in today's game. We look forward to having Eddie on board to assist our efforts to improve our ball club. So for me, this is not really much of a big deal. Yeah, um, it's really not. And I know they have the vacancy of a general manager, but you know they look like they have a guy that can possibly take that role anyway. So I think they're trying, they usually go with in-house anyway, unless you're Theo Epstein and who was, I think he was in-house as well when he was with the Red Sox. And now he went to Chicago. Literally is on the verge of breaking two curses, by the way. That's I, want the, to, I want to point that out. That's the one thing that I look back with Boston is like, you let Theo Epstein get away. Like imagine, uh, I know, imagine I, if they didn't. Like I can't believe I know he is but, clearly the best GM in baseball. Dude. Yeah, uh, probably Seriously. the past decade. He past is cl- decade. He turned around the Red Sox. He turned around the Cubs. Now he's clearly hands down the best GM. Yeah, there is. he literally turned around two franchises, and that's amazing. He broke almost. He broke one curse. Might break another one, but we'll move on. So they, you know, the Red Sox usually tire, you know, inside house. So. It's not really a big deal. It looks like Eddie Romero is kind of being groomed to be the GM in a few years anyway. So I think, you know, he's kind of have to learn how it operates, you know, how to learn pretty much the job before he gets promoted to the general manager position. So I do think it's not big of a deal. I do think, you know, it's just a move to, you know, a future for the future. Romero's basically going to be the GM anyway. As he's the basically, GM, exactly. He's going to be, he's basically, obviously, he's going to be working with others and the, the president of two more organizations, the scouts, all that stuff. So he's still going to be working with them, but he's basically calling the shots anyway. So as long as he doesn't screw things up and the Red Sox continue to have good years like they did this pre, this past one, I think he'll be okay. Yeah, it, he, that's, why, that's what I'm trying to get to. He's basically going to be the GM anyway. So, yeah. All right, but we're going to take our second break at the – Gordon State Media Concepts Baseball Podcast, and we're going to do, get into some uh, injury news regarding Clayton Kershaw. Yes, we'll be right back here at the Gordon State Media Concepts Baseball Podcast. Here. Yet, you just don't know what to do. All these shows telling you this and that, but nothing seems to work. Well, listen close. Golden State Media Concepts has got something great for you. The health and wellness podcast dedicated to workout trends, healthy eating habits, diet, and everything about healthy living. Join us in our banters as we help you not just live life to the fullest, but live it to the healthiest. Welcome back in to the Golden State Media Concepts Baseball Podcast. Going to be ending the show with our last segment here, talking about Dodgers ace Clayton Kershaw and how he's actually not going to have to have back surgery. Yes, Clayton Kershaw is unlikely to, you know, need back surgery for the hernia disc, you know, that sidelined him for nearly two months or more than two months, for that matter. According to President of Baseball Operations Andrew Friedman. You know, for the Los Angeles Dodgers. So he said that he said the news that he does not need back surgery. Uh, if you remember, Kershaw returned in early September, but never really publicly went into full details about his back injury. And in his absence, the team did go 38 and 24, but won first place in the uh, National League West, overtook the San Francisco Giants, who kind of had a horrid second half, even though they made the playoffs. So. The, he did struggle in uh, 
you know, at game six of the NLCS, um, you know, he did get plummeled. He got really destroyed in that game. But if you're the Dodgers, you got to be pretty happy that your ace does not need back surgery because that would have even lingered even more on to spring training and all that. But it looks like he's going to be fully healthy for spring training, going to be ready for opening day if nothing happens uh, during spring training. So look, you got to be really – got to be good. You got to be feeling good if you're the Dodgers here. Definitely. You're not, not really sure if that back injury kind of affected him in the postseason, which – Honestly, it might have. He had an ERA of 4.44 in the whole postseason. He didn't really pitch phenomenal with the exception of that that one game against Chicago where he threw seven innings or, yeah, seven innings only gave up two hits on short rest. So every other game he gave up at least two runs. So I'm sorry, three runs. So he gave up 12 runs in a total of 24 innings. So it's possible that he still had some sort of effect with that back injury. And now that you have, you know, three, four months to really just – do some R and R, some rest, and, some rest and relaxation. It's going to be the best thing to benefit Kershaw. And not needing surgery, like you said, is something that you don't really have to deal with setbacks. You don't have to deal with things that aren't healing as quickly as they should have. So he can just kind of take it easy and get ready for spring training. Yeah, and you know the Dodgers do have a couple of uh, free agents, you know, that might sign with other teams. Um, I think Kenley Jansen, the closer. I think he's going to look for a bigger contract. I don't know if he's going to be with the Dodgers. I know the Dodgers can afford it, but I'm not sure if the Dodgers want to pay him big money there. Uh, you know, and Justin Turner, who had a phenomenal season, phenomenal postseason too, is going to be a free agent. I do. I think the Dodgers are going to try to bring back Justin Turner. He was pretty much the unsung hero. He was the catalyst of this team the whole entire year. Um, I do think Kenley Jansen is going to – I don't know if Kenley Jansen is going to be there. Um, you know, Yelso Puig, we don't know the future status on him. He can be a part of this team. We didn't think he was going to be on the Dodgers, you know, pretty much at this point, dating back to July. But if you're the Dodgers, you got to be feeling good about Kershaw. And all you got to do is pretty much, uh, you know, re-sign your free agents, the ones that you want to keep, and they should be back in the playoffs next year. I agree with you. They lost Zach Greinke this year to go to Arizona, and I thought, oh, wow, like that's a huge loss for, for the Dodgers. I feel like that will probably even knock them out. Their lineup's not as good. Their starting pitching's not as good without Greinke. But really, they played just as good without him. And even without Kershaw for a few months, Corey Seager's probably going to win Rookie of the Year. So you have sort of another centerpiece at shortstop to build around. Jock Peterson out there in left field. Yasmani Grandal in the outfield as well. Like you said, not sure what's going to happen with Puig, so we'll have to sort of decide from there. It seems like if you would have asked that question a few months ago, he would be totally out of the water. But now he's sort of revitalized himself a little bit after going down to the minors and then some of his postseason success. So I have to wait and see. I feel like Dodgers are still a pretty good team. Yeah, and remember, the Dodgers almost pulled off a trade, Ryan Braun, for Yasa Puig. They almost did it. They almost did it, but they backed out. And if Turner doesn't come back, uh, manager Dave Roberts did say uh, Corey Seager could potentially move to third base. So, yeah. But I, th- I think I think Turner will. He's yeah, had he success will, come these back. last couple of years. I'm sure he likes it out there. It's L.A. who wouldn't like it. And you're still a really good team. So, like you said, the Dodgers can splash the cash. So, I think he's going to get the contract he probably wants and deserves from L.A. Yeah, but I don't know if Kenny Jansen is going to get the cash that he wants from L.A. He's a really good closer. Is, I expect is. I expect him to sort of maybe get some good offers from somewhere else. I think what he's he definitely, did... He's definitely going to get one from the Giants. I guarantee you that. <laughs> well, uh, the Giants get, might give a lot of offers to a lot of people yeah. that are sort of relievers because their bullpen was probably the worst in Major League. But I think when you look at Kenley Jansen, he proved some of the, sometime this postseason that he's even capable of going two innings, an inning and a third, those, some of these long saves. So he's capable of sort of being someone's long-term closer for years to come, not necessarily just a, f- a few months or anything. So it's pretty good. Yeah, it's pretty good. But I do expect the Dodgers to come back and make the playoffs next year. But that concludes our show, Ben. Really great show today. Uh, We talked about the World Series. We talked about the American League East. We talked about Clayton Kershaw. We'll be back next week, possibly talking about Game 7 of the World Series. Game 7 would be next Wednesday, November 2nd. Yeah, we might So it is possible. It is possible. We might happen. It might not happen. I expect the series to go seven games. You do, too. We're going to have to wait and see. But Regardless, we'll still be reviewing everything in the World Series. We're still going to talk about baseball. 
have regardless. to. This is the baseball show. Of we course. have to. We can't. I don't know what else we will talk about here. If we're not going to talk. I don't know if we're talking about your boy Tim Tebow. Tim T Ball, you mean? Tim T Ball, yeah. I, I, I completely forgot about that. I right, well, anyways, we'd like to thank you guys for tuning in to the Going to Me Concerts Baseball Podcast. Uh, we like to. I'm uh, Jeremiah. I am Ben. And thank you guys for listening. You've been listening to the Golden State Media Concepts Baseball Podcast, part of the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. You can find this show and others like it at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Download our podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Just type in GSMC to find all the shows from the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network, from movies to movies music from sports to entertainment and even weird news you can also follow us on twitter and on facebook thank you and we hope you have enjoyed today's program